thank you for coming and uh, listening to both of us. Um, I'm going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to talk about the work associated with the Hardy Fellowship that I was uh, very um, happy to receive this year, really focused on technologies that will support the learning and engagement of struggling learners in the STEM areas. Uh, so the rationale, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why I'm focusing on technology and games, but the first one, and this is the big why for me, is that we know that kids with disabilities and kids um, that are at risk for academic failure are really struggling in the STEM areas. And there are a lot of reasons that are cited in the literature. Uh, primarily, um, these subjects are often reading tests for children. So if you cannot read the textbook, um, you struggle. Uh, there's a heavy vocabulary load. There are some studies that have shown that there are more new vocabulary words in a um, science chapter than in a foreign language unit. So if you don't have a strong command of vocabulary, you're going to str uh, struggle. Um, it's also a very rapid progression of new information as teachers are trying to meet the benchmarks and get through the material. There's not a lot of opportunities for practice and for deep understanding. And often these subjects are quite abstract, so students have um, difficulty with that. Any, any student who has a problem with abstract concepts are going to struggle with that. So, so that's the problem, right? So <laughs> instead of um, admiring the problem, trying to come up with solutions is, is one of the things that I do. One of those is that we know that kids are playing games. They're playing video games, they're playing on their mobile devices, um, and both boys and girls across the ages are playing. And there's something about these games that are really engaging and keeping their attention. So thinking about what we could do from a game-based learning perspective to capitalize on the engagement that kids are having within games um, is something that we should do. And it's not to say that we're wanting to replace traditional instruction and hands-on learning and inquiry learning. It's just thinking that is there something that we can do to enhance that in addition to. All right, so uh, preliminary research is interesting when it comes to gaming. Uh, there have been some studies that have said that um, it increases motivation, uh, promotes self-esteem, improves skill acquisition and generalization, and can accelerate learning. So th that's the good news. The bad news is the data is quite inconsistent. So um, a study by um, Young et al. in 2012, it was a lit review, looked at all of the different video game studies across the disciplines and said, you know, some say it increases learning, some say it doesn't increase learning, um, and that was essentially what came out of that study. Um, recently, I put in a uh, paper for review of educational research that's hopefully going to be in print at some point um, that looked at science video games that looked at independent variables related to gender, um, disability, and other socioeconomic factors. Um, that particular study, no, not surprisingly, showed that very few studies are actually looking at demographics, and those that do are very inconsistent. So some say no gender differences, some say yes gender differences, some say girls are presented as novice gamers, and so they're not doing as well as boys for those reasons. So um, essentially what we know is that we know very little about gaming and learning, and that uh, the way that games have been researched in the past have been fairly simplistic. First they didn't know it, now they do know it, there is a difference or there isn't a difference. So we really want to move beyond that to say what is it within games that either support students or don't support students. So I've got two different projects that I'll very quickly <laughs> talk to you about. Um, one is the Hardy project, which is thinking about game development. The other one is about uh, a research project that really examines the nuances in student learning across different video games. So the Hardy Fellowship essentially has to do with game development around epistemic understanding of the STEM profession. So we'll talk about that. The content of that one has to do with zero net energy homes. And the reason that we're picking that content is because we have folks on this, cam on this campus that do research in this area. And Ty Newell actually built the Equinox house, which is a zero net energy home. And so we can use the data from his house within this gaming environment. So it's a nice collaborative um, project. Uh, the, 
the other project which really goes hand in hand with this is thinking if I create a game for students, um, I can't make assumptions that all students are going to benefit from it equally, right? So the world that I live in is looking at student variation and variability and what is it about um, the characteristics of particular students and their motivations and their struggles that either make them um, benefit from or not benefit from a specific learning environment. So that particular project is looking at gender, reading ability, uh, disability status, attitudes about gaming, attitudes about STEM, and whether all of those things result in differences in performance across gaming conditions. Okay, so the first project is the ZeroNet Energy Home Game, and this has been almost a year-long process at this point, and I still feel like I'm barely scratching the surface on this, so I'm not really presenting a lot of data. I'm just going to present you with where I am and where I'm hoping to go with it. Um, the context is that there's a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. His name is David Williamson Schaefer, and he and his team have developed a suite of epistemic video games. Um, what I like about what David has done is that he's not just thinking about content, right? I'm going to learn about sustainable energy. He's actually also focused on how are we going to present kids with professional experiences. So learning about the professions um, as well as learning about the content that the professionals have to use. So there's a real um, uh, authentic context for learning within that. Um, here, sorry, I'm going beyond my notes. Uh, so one of the games that we started looking at that has been fully developed is called Land Science. And in this one, it's a, it's a game in which fictitious um, interns are working in an urban design firm. And they're having to make decisions about land use um, that has to do with, you know, how are we going to design, make urban design decisions in a way that is um, environmentally uh, not <coughs> too harmful, but is still taking into consideration all the multiple stakeholders as well. So we ran uh, this study in the fall um, just to learn about the accessibility features within this particular game system and to see, just get as informed as we possibly can about epistemic games. Um, and so we took that information and then collaboratively uh, with folks from engineering, so uh, John Abelson and Ty Newell in engineering, and then Mike Williams, who I think is here a moment ago, um, and Jeannie Bruner, who are both students here in education. Jeannie has a science background as well to create um, a universally designed virtual internship, kind of an epistemic environment related to how do we design a zero net energy home. And the hope of that is to not only get a better understanding of how do we design this particular game, it's really about developing a blueprint that we can use when we're thinking about accessible and engaging learning environments for all learners. So we know that universal design for learning is going to be a piece of it. We know that we're going to have to have a learning progression that may be linear for some students and more open for other students. So it'll provide that framework that will allow us to make uh, better design decisions in the future. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay. So yeah, that's where we were in terms of the development process. What we're doing in a couple of weeks is we're using participatory design, which is one of my favorite things to do with children, um, in thinking about how can we work alongside students to be part of the game design process. Um, this worked really well when I did this last year in a game around um, electricity and circuits. And what we found at that point is that kids really know what they want. <laughs> they really have a good sense of what kind of supports should be built in the system based both on their experience with commercial games and their experiences in school. So when we looked at that particular study, um, we noticed that yes, participatory design is a good process, but we also realized that we know very little about how to engage kids as participants in the design process. Typically what we do is we design a system and then we do a bunch of usability studies and kids provide us information about is this ambiguous, does this make sense, um, do you understand the process in the game. Uh, but what I'd like to propose and other researchers have done too is that kids really ought to be part of the process the problem with not knowing exactly 
how to use kids is that we have to study that piece of it as well. So that's a phenomenon on its own within the process. So we're going to have three different conditions where um, we're providing different levels of instruction and support to kids to see how that informs their design process as they're giving us information about the use of zero, zero net energy homes. So that's happening in just a few weeks. Um, we've been working on content development uh, this semester and um, that's ongoing and then hopefully uh, this summer and into the fall we're going to be doing some prototyping of our game so that we can be competitive for you know future funds that will support you know real game development which is actually quite costly so that's the first project now you'll see that this one the second project actually fits um, quite well with this as well. So we started off by saying yes, we think games are good for learning, but the data is really inconsistent and we have a very simplistic way of looking at kids and learning within games. So in order to develop a good game, I need to really understand both uh, the game system and the students as participants within that. So that's what this particular study is. So um, Filament Games is a company out of Madison and they develop serious video games. And essentially serious video games are educational games that uh, use the motivations within commercial games but attach that to academic learning. So Filament, ha there's it's got a whole suite of games, but the ones that I'm going to focus on are three. One is called Cell Command, and Cell Command is very much like a first-person shooter type of game. So you're in control, and you've got your platoon of organelles, and you're navigating <laughs> through the system. So that's Cell Command. Um, you Make Me Sick is a game where uh, the whole purpose is to make someone as sick as possible, as fast as possible. Right? So you can either design your own pathogen if you have a lot of background knowledge, or you can pick from a pathogen a bacteria or virus, so the flu or Ebola or whatever. <laughs> and um, you can decide whether you know, it's uh, you know, skin contact or you have to breathe it in. And you have a lot of information about the host, so that'll inform you in terms of what kind of pathogen you should um, design. And Crazy Plant Shop is about designing um, alien species of plants. So you're using Punnett squares and you're going through more and more complex variations to collaboratively develop these um, funky <laughs> organisms. So within this study, what I wanted to do is take the same kids, the same group of diverse learners through all three games. And this was a collaborative effort with my colleague, uh, Matt Marino at Central Florida, and we already mentioned Filament Games. So there's a whole team of folks. When you do a study like this, it's not a single person. Um, and so we had 366 students. Oh, and Sam Wang, who is a student here who helped with the data analysis, who's fabulous. Um, and we went through all three of the games with the 366 kids. Um, and then we had um, pre-tests and post-tests that were validated with content experts that related to content within the game. Now the problem is, and we'll get back to this, is that they're paper and pencil pre and post test. Like that is the bane of my research existence. So we've got kids who don't love reading and writing and what are we doing to assess their learning? We're giving them paper and pencil tests. So we have to move beyond that, but, and we will. We have to start somewhere. Um, so we examined their performance, but not just did they learn something. We actually wanted to look at gender, um, NAEP reading cut scores, disability status, attitudes about science, attitudes about video games to see are kids going to perform the same across the different games? Are they going to perform differently? Are these variables going to be at all related to that performance? So these were the research questions. Are there specific game-specific differences um, in post-tests across participants? Is there a relationship between their attitudes and those results? And are there interactions of demographic variables that contribute to those results? Our methodology was quasi-experimental, pre-post, paper and pencil tests, and we used multi-level modeling because we wanted to really make sure that we understood the nuances between them. These were all kind of the level one differences. Level two were school and classroom, which actually didn't give us a lot of information. So that's why we're going to focus on these right now. I'm at 14 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to go fast. So here's the good news and the bad news. Um, 
we realize that it's a lot messier <laughs> than uh, what we in saw in the literature before, but it's really what I anticipated. So kids essentially made gains from pre to post tests, uh, but that's not the big deal, right? Because you got something new, the kids are introduced to it, and then they learn afterwards. Uh, what was interesting to me is what characteristics were consistent across the games and what characteristics were inconsistent. So there were three variables that were consistent. Um, not surprising, pretest scores. So how well you performed on pretest is related to how well you perform on post tests. The other two was reading ability across all three games. Even though these were not text heavy games, reading ability made a difference. If you were a better reader, you performed better on the tests. And attitudes about science. The more um, positive your attitudes were about science, the better you performed across all three games. Um, and we can interpret why that is pretty easily, probably. Uh, the other interesting thing is that there were differences across the three games. Um, and I can hypothesize about why that is, but first let me just give you those differences. So cell command had some interactions between gender and attitudes about science. Now, I don't know whether that's because it's more of a, I, I mean, I don't know, I'd hate to, I hate to simplify gender differences, so I won't do that right here, but um, that's a difference there. Crazy plant shop, no gender differences, no interactions with gender at all, uh, but disability made a difference. This was the only game where kids with learning disabilities was a factor. So again, why, why is this happening? Is it because there is some kind of cascading effect? Because as the Punnett squares are getting more complex, kids with learning disabilities are struggling more than other students? I don't know. And then You Make Me Sick, this was my huge conundrum because I love this game. But it had almost every single interaction that was possible happened in this game. So gender, attitudes about gaming, um, attitudes about science, there are all sorts of messy interactions within this. Something's happening in this game that I can't um, make any sense of. Uh, and the thing is, is I don't know that I need to make sense of it at this point. The whole purpose of this study was to show that we're looking at this way too simplistically and we need to go beyond this as we're thinking about games. So uh, future studies are going to explain the why, hopefully. <laughs> but right now, at least what we've shown is that uh, there's some nuanced differences amongst learning um, and attitudes and demographics. So, so what, right? This is what it's all about. Um, we can't say that games are either good for learning or not good for learning, just like we can't say that books are good for learning, and we can't say that you know, direct instruction is good for learning. We can't do that. We have to go beyond a very simplistic yes or no answer here. Um, we need to think about complex interactions between what's happening in the game and actually what's happening in the classroom too. So what are teachers doing as games are being used in the classroom? Is the teacher going, okay, let's stop right here. What decisions were being made? Who decided to pick this kind of pathogen compared to that kind of pathogen? Um, the teacher is involved in the process or should be involved and how, how does that happen is something that we need to really consider as well as thinking about the characteristics of the students and the game itself. Um, the third bullet there is that developers and researchers really need to work together. There are all these new apps that are popping up on the App Store and they're making a ton of money. Um, and I think that there's very little research around what's happening within them beyond how much money that they're bringing in. Um, we really have to make this a collaborative effort between researchers and programmers. And then the last thing is that we need to move beyond paper and pencil tests have to move beyond paper and pencil tests. Um, we have the capabilities right now of using analytics in a sophisticated way to look at um, data within the system that informs the learner as the learner moves through the system and can inform the teacher and can provide um, formative assessment information along the way. So that I think is, a, is an important next step in the process. So that in a nutshell is what I've been doing with this. <laughs> So again, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about a completely different topic, but I want to give you kind of <laughs> um, kind of overview of what I'm going to say. Um, I was thinking, what should I talk about? Because we have only 15 minutes, and it's not a lot. And something I do with my doc student in one of the courses, we do a roadmap. We start the course with each person is taking a big page. Remember that, Quinn? 
squares, a big, pick of, uh, big piece of paper, and we do a roadmap of our life. Because I believe that every experience we have during our life leads us to where we are now. So what I, I want to do, I want to focus on a very small piece of my roadmap and talk about my line of research in the past few years. And I'm not going to talk about one specific project. Um, I'm going to talk how each project led to each other. Um, so this is my roadmap. And we know that in roadmaps, there's bumps, and there's no turn, and there's no entrance. So different things lead us to different places. And um, this is my own roadmap. Before I even start talking, I want to talk about my research team. As Maya uh, mentioned, every project, every research we're doing is a, is a team effort. It's collaboration. And Jim Halley was my um, um, advisor here when I did my PhD many years ago, when I was young, 14 years ago. Um, and the other, Melinda, Lori, Moon, Kim, and Sarah are doc students who work with us. And all the work that I'm going to present today is related to the work and effort of all of us. So I want to thank them um, before I even begin. Um, a little bit of background about autism and why or the making the case. Last week, I don't know how many of you received the notice from CDC that the numbers of kids with autism uh, jumped from last year it was 1 to 88. Two days ago it jumped to 1 to 68. Ten years ago it was 1 to 188. So every kid out of 68 kids in the US has autism. Um, so it's, we have a lot of kids with autism that need some support. Um, we know that kids with autism, one of the main characteristics they have, they have problem and deficit in social communication skills. So this is the topic I'm working on. And when we talk about autism, we're talking about spectrum. So this is something we really need to kind of talk about. Spectrum, when we have people some of them here at the university that are very smart, are you know, very, you know, very capable of doing, but they have some social interaction difficulties. And we also have people who are nonverbal, who have also intellectual disabilities. So it's really a spectrum. And when we talk about 68, it's a spectrum of kids, it's including those who used to be identified as kids with Asperger and those who have really severe autism. Right, um, in October, um, the new DSM came out, and they changed the definition. So instead of having the subcategories of autism and separate Asperger, now it's all under one umbrella. So I talk about autism. It's kids with Asperger who are very capable and functioning in the world, and kids who are nonverbal. And these are the kids we're working with. Jim and I work with kids who are very young, three years old and younger, who have no communi verbal communication. So they have less than 10 functional um, words or sign. Um, another thing we know is that parents of young kids with autism really seek access to evidence-based practices. Um, and, and, and we know they want that. We know parents, of especially young kids, spend a lot of time with them. We want them to be able to use strategy to facilitate communication with the kids. And we know also that parents implement intervention, which means intervention that parents implement with their own kids are effective. This is kind of the rational um, for all the work that we are uh, currently working on. Um, so line of research, I'm going to talk about the three projects that I'm going to discuss and then just give you kind of a quick overview of each one of them and how each one of them led to the Hardy that I was fortunate enough to receive last year. So the first one was parent and the names are, you'll see, they're changing and um, creative. So Parent Implemented Communication Strategy, it's the PEAK project. It's an IES grant that I received with my colleagues at ISU, and it was goal two. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, when I did the PEAKs part of the last part of the, of the grant, I was in Israel, and I did everything through Skype. I was teaching full time at ISU through Skype. I ran the grant. I was an all committee. I was the chair of the awards committee at ISU during that time. So I did everything through Skype. And then I felt, maybe I should use it for my research too. And that led to the research board grant that I received here with Jim. Um, and we called it IPIX, so inter uh, Internet-Based Parent Implemented Intervention. And this research, it's the same idea, but everything was done through Skype. We did all the, all the training, all the coaching, all the session were through Skype. And this, and this was in 2012, and this led to the IPIX 
who knows what will come next. <laughs> I don't know what's coming next. Um, and this is the internet-based parent implementation. But in addition to the training um, that we do with parents through Skype, we're going to do online, we're doing now online modules that, so we can scale up. So the idea here, the goal of all of this is to provide parents with evidence-based strategies so they can use with their own kids in the home. As a parent of four kids, I know I try all these strategies at home. Most of them don't work with my own kids, but they work with other parents. And I, I really feel like I need to have the strategy to work with my own kids, and parents really want that. Um, so the overall goal is to provide this evidence base to parents and see how we can reach as many parents as, as we can. And the scaling up and the using of the technology is helping us reach many parents in remote area and other places. Um, so this is kind of the overall goal of what we're doing. Um, one thing I want to say about parents is that, and this is a different, different intervention, different project that we're working on. When we talk about, we teach parents how to use different strategy, we really need to think about the balance between how much we expect the parents to be a teacher, how much we expect the parents to be a parent. Um, Knowing with my own kid, I have one kid who have learning disability and I had to work with him every night with the flash, you know, flash cards. And I, I felt it's affecting the interaction, the mother-child interaction between me and him. So when we train the parents, we need to think about how much we should expect them to do and how much we should help them find the balance. And this is something we talk a lot about. How can we find the balance? Some parents tell me, tell us, we don't want to be the teacher of the child, we want to be the parents. Other parents give us more strategy and then they use a lot of strategy with the kids. So the idea here is to give them evidence-based practices so we know research found them effective. We want to use it in the natural environment, so within the natural routine, so that when we play on the carpet with our kids, we can use this strategy. Um, and we want to make sure that the balance between having fun, this is something I really ask the parents at the end, do, do you still have fun with your kids or not? And, and really using the strategy and promoting and giving the kids opportunity to communicate. So a little bit about each one of the strategy. I know my time is almost done, but um, so the PIC project, the one from IS, I work with Maureen Angel and Julia Storner from ISU, good friend and great colleagues. Um, this was a development IS goal too, so we develop all the materials. And it was all face to face. So I was the coach. I went into the parents' house four times a week for at least an hour. I sat with them. I told them what to do with the kids. I observed them for a while. And then I gave them feedback. So this is kind of the training and coaching model that we did. We develop a lot of materials. We have instructional um, DVD, very nice, a lot of stuff, great. Uh, fidelity, reliability, all the procedures are ready. And we have all the data. And the data show us the parents can implement the intervention with fidelity. So can you, they can use it correctly. And we also see changes in the kids' behavior. And something that's really important for me is that the parents talk about changes in their quality of life. So they say, now we can sit in the table and not get frustrated because the kids doesn't understand me. I can give him prompt. I can model to him what he needs to do. So quality of life is something we all you know, want to be able to. And when parents tell me, I, it changed my life, that's enough for me. It's not enough for publishing it, but it's enough for me. Um, so we have all the materials. So what's next? OK, it's effective. We have all the materials. What, what's next? How can we scale it up? And me going into co parents' house four times a week, it's not feasible. We cannot do it with so many parents. So again, this at the end of the grant, I was a in Israel, um, and I did everything through Skype. So I said, okay, let's try and do this through Skype and see where we go with that. Can we do the same? Can we get the same result? Could it be effective if we do it um, from far away? Um, some advantages of long distance, it's travel time. I'm talking with young kids, so we have early interventionists that go into the homes and do the, all the intervention. Time going into the home. Um, Sometimes I kid got to the home and the child was sick, or he's still doing nap time, so you have to go back. You have to cancel. Um, you don't need to, it's distracting just to have present another person in the house. It's encouraged parents to participate if someone is only remote, so the parents have to be the one that interact with the kids. And of course, we can uh, cover a lot of um, places. So these are kind of advantages, and it's of, of, of course talking also about the disadvantages of doing face to face. I want to kind of pause for a second. 
I believe in face-to-face. -face. I believe in the online learning. I believe in all of that. But going into the home and building the relationship with the, with the parents and the family is something that we are now actually, um, we're taking all the data that we have and we're doing secondary analysis now to see how we build rapport over the internet. Can we really build rapport the same way we can do it face to face? So there's kind of both advantages and disadvantages for both. So this led to the um, IPEX uh, project that was funded by the research board here at U of I and Jim and I received that. Uh, and it's the internet based. So we took the same material, the same procedure, but we did everything through Skype. So we did the training through Skype. Maybe I should show you um, the technology and then I'll go back to this one. So we gave the parents iPads. Some, one of them at least had one, so we didn't have to give them. We used Skype as video conferencing, and this problem with Skype, if you try to get f external funding, um, we just got a, uh, a grant that was not funded. It was ranked very high, and their excuse, I don't know, there might be something else, but the only excuse was Skype is not HIPAA compliance, so we cannot use Skype in federal, in federal um, funding. So we're changing it now. Now we have something different. But we use Skype. It's free. People are familiar with that. We use, we use Box, the university Box, so parents um, can upload all the information. They videotape parent-child interaction and upload it into Box, and we analyze it, edit that, and share it with them. Um, the calendar, so they know when their appointment, they get reminders, what they need to do. And Camtasia. Camtasia is what uh, you can see here. Camtasia is a software that just um, videotape everything on your screen. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. You probably are familiar with that. Um, I was very excited about that because I didn't know anything about that. But we, what we do, we do all the training on Skype and we videotape everything. And then the parent-child interaction are playing with bubbles, whatever, and we videotape that. Then we analyze the data and we edit the information. So we have a flow chart ch and we share the screen with the parents so they can see the edited videos and they can see, okay, you establish joint attention. You have the child, the same attention with you and the child on the same object for the bubbles. Uh, you present a question. You use the strategy we taught you. Um, the child didn't respond, so uh, you gave him another mend, another strategy to use. So we show the parents exactly what they did correct and what they might want to work on. And this is the feedback, feedback we provide to the parents. And they really, really like that. We share with them the edited uh, videos. And um, we can analyze it, of course, do the behavioral uh, assessment that we do to relate to that. So this is the Camtasia. And um, going back to that, so, so what's next? Um, I'm sharing with you very quickly, uh, I don't want to overwhelm you, some data, just so you believe we collect some data. We have a tons of data. So this is one graph, and I'm going to uh, try to guide you through that. It's one family. So we're using single case design, which means uh, each family serves as her own control. So we change. We examine changes within each family. And we have, um, in this one, we have uh, three different strategies we teach the parents. The first line, the first graph, we teach them how to use modeling. So um, I want you to say cookie, I say cookie, and then I hope that you're going to imitate me. The second line, I'm going to use them to teach them how to use man models. So I'm going to ask, do you want a cookie? And hope the child will say yes. Or I'm giving them a choice. Do you want a cookie or you want an apple? So this is the second strategy. And the last one is time delay, something that actually Jim was one of the first people who <coughs> introduced this strategy, where you, and this is something that's very difficult for me, but very difficult for many other parents, you wait. You just wait for a second and let the child initiate a communication. So it, within a routine, you probably know um, in a swing, so you swing a child and then you stop the swing and wait for the child to ask for more. So this is a wait time. This is a time delay. So these are the three strategy, and this is the child behavior. So we're not going to focus on that. Then we have baseline. We're just collecting data and just analyzing the parent, parent behavior and the child behavior. The bar graphs are the frequency, how many times the parents use this strategy. The line graph is the quality. Did they use it correctly with fidelity or not? So if we look at the first one, I wish I had something here. But if you look at the first one, um, does this help? So the baseline, we see the mother hardly used the strategy. And she, when she used it, it's with uh, low 
low quality. Then we do the training, we just teach them about the strategy. And we see some increase in the amount, in the numbers of time the mother used that. We see very variable information about the quality. Sometimes she used it correctly, sometimes she used it incorrectly. When we do the coaching, this is where we talk with them, we look at them, we give them the feedback. We see a very nice increase in the number. You see here, from here to here. We see a nice increase in the number and we also see increase in the fidelity. They use it correctly. You can, do this, you can see the same um, trend with the second one. When we do the coaching here, we can see increase in the frequency and very high fidelity, and also with the third one. I'm not going to focus about on the kids. So this is kind of a quick review of, of, of the um, data that we have so far. So we saw that it's effective when we're doing face-to-face, -face, and it's effective when we do it in Skype. So what's next? What should we do next? We still want to do to scale up the data. We still want to scale up the, the, the goal for me is that every parent will have access to that. That every parent who have a child with autism or developmental disability who do not talk will have access to these models and will learn the strategy because we know it's effective. It's improving both the parents' behavior and the kids' behavior. So next was the Hardy project at 2.01. Um, and what we're doing here, what we're developing, and I, we don't have enough time, so I cannot share with you, but it's kind of, I really, I'm very excited of what the products we have so far. We develop online self-directed, self-based learning modules that the parents can learn by themselves how to use the strategy. It includes video clips, it includes check for understanding, it's very interactive. It includes, of course, all the principles of uh, adult learning with introduction, illustration of different parents using it, uh, practice. The parents have to practice that, send us videos so we can see how they're doing. And of course, they have um, tests to see. So we're looking at two different variables. We're looking at knowledge. We see if the parents learn the information and increase the knowledge. And we're looking at the implementation, if the parents really know how to practice. So this is what we're doing now for the Hardy um, project that we're working on. Uh, we develop all the modules. We're now doing testing of different, uh, different things to see, make everything is uh, clear, and then we're ready to implement it again, and again, scanning it up. Um, so again, we have the training. The modules are developed and hosted on Blackboard. Coaching, instead of Skype, we're going to use uh, Real Presence. It's Polycom. It's here at the university. The IT people really help us with that because it's HIPAA compliance with something that everything. We just submitted another grant and we highlighted the HIPAA compliance. Maybe it will help next time. Um, we're still learning the program. Uh, we met uh, with the CITL, the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning. They're helping us to give us feedback of everything we develop. So the next step is just to um, check. The, the effectiveness, we want to see parents increase knowledge, parents increase high quality of the strategy, which means fidelity, and if kids increase communication behavior. And our next step, we always look at the next step in the, in the roadmap, is that we as researchers cannot coach all the family in the country. The people who really do it is service provider. It's early intervention professional who, who in, interact with parents and give them training. So the next step will be to develop some training for service provider, make all these material, material available so everyone can use that to work with the kids in, on their caseload. So this is very quickly. I have 20 seconds. Um, thank you. And this is just the article that we have from the, I, the PICS, the IPICS, and IPICS 2.0 so far. Thank you. I'm done. Yeah, I have a question uh, for Ada. Mm -hmm. um, when you give the parents the video, the annotated videos, uh, how long are those videos? Uh, I mean, is it an hour-long session okay. of annotated interactions, or, or are you giving them? I guess I'm just curious mm -hmm. how many days. So first of all, we're talking about very young kids, three years old with autism. So the attention span is very short. Mm -hmm. So our observation are only five minutes long. And then the feedback with the edited are very short, could be 30 seconds, could be one minute, not more than that, because we all have a learning capacity, so it's very short. Overall, the sessions with the feedback is about half an hour with the observation, but the feedback itself is very short. Mm -hmm. And the parents have access to that whenever they want through a box. And, okay, that's helpful. And then kind of a follow-up question. I can see how it would be very powerful if, um, uh, a 
parent is working with their own child and then watching that video. But I'm wondering if it would be possible for, let's say, me as a parent watching Maya work with her child mm -hmm. and seeing an annotated video. Have you, have you looked at that? Yeah, first, it's a great point. This is only supplemental service model. It's important for me to emphasize that. I don't expect the parents to replace the service providers. I do not want them. I want them to be able to watch. In the modules, we have a lot of these examples. We have a lot of examples of other parents working with the kids with annotation and everything. This is part of the training. But I want to make sure that you know that this is not replacement of direct service, because I truly believe direct service is the best service, but we want to give the parents the evidence-based practices they can use at home. In the online modules that are now being produced are exactly the kind of yeah. thing you're talking about, where parents see other parents applying the procedures. So mm -hmm. that is exactly where head of the group went, mm -hmm. that part of uh, trying to teach parents without uh, our involvement, uh, seeing if we could uh, give them a module that they could learn on their own, and that was one important aspect, or at least we believe it to be one important aspect. And it's interactive, so they see a video and then they have the, f the, the flow chart mm -hmm. and they have to click on which step the parents did correctly, which step they didn't do correctly. So, and then they get immediate feedback about their answer. So, they, I mean, we hope yeah. that it will work. <laughs> I just have a follow-up question to that. How much time does it take the service providers to, to watch that video and put that feedback together? Uh, now it's us, the researcher, it takes time. I mean, Camtasia is very friendly, even for me, who doesn't know too much about technology <laughs> compared to my, um, it, it's very friendly, it doesn't, and it, we're talking about very short clips, so it's not, it's just editing. It's like, yeah, it doesn't take too long. Mm -hmm. Just a quick follow-up, service providers, we haven't done anything with them. Yeah. So I was just thinking ahead. Yeah, thinking ahead. Yes. I have a Maya question, so I don't know whether we want to switch off here or how you want to do things, but I'll ask a Maya question. Sure. Um, so I was wondering about, you talked about uh, assessing children's participation in the development process. Yeah. And you talked about three, or I think it sounded like there were three different yeah. methods or ways you were going to do this. I was wondering, what are the dependent variables you use to determine which way works best? How do you know? Mm -hmm. How do you know what's optimal in terms of outcome? Yeah. I mean, I can see how you come up with possibly different, mm -hmm. you, know, you have them participate different ways and different things will happen as a result. Yeah. But how do you know which way is mm -hmm. best or better? Yeah, and that, that's one of the issues, right? So there aren't, there's not a research base around that. So I can tell you what we're doing right now, um, and then we'll evaluate whether it, those are good dependent variables. So essentially there are two things we want to see. Um, the whole purpose of participatory design is to inform the design process. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look at the level of sophistication of the designs that the students are using. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we are doing um, a pre-post test related to the content as well because what we want to do is know is there a relationship between the level of understanding of the content that the students have and the level of um, understanding and experience with games on the design process and so we're creating these scenario scenario based problems for the students to work through before and after to see whether um, there is a relationship between that uh, but we haven't run this study yet and we've piloted um, we, I guess we've done a small pilot of it to see um, what kind of dependent measures are good <laughs> or not. And so we're still in that process right now. We're going to be a lot smarter about it um, in a few weeks. So we've got three different conditions, right? Because the question is, you know, what, what can we do to support kids in helping in the design process? Uh, the first study that I talked about, we did a whole lot of instructional related to circuits and electricity ahead of time. And so we had some evidence that the students understood circuits and electricity, and then we looked at their design processes. Um, what we're doing now is we're going to have three different conditions. One, where we're just presenting the design challenge to the students and saying, we have you know, this process, please help us. And we're not saying a game, by the way. In the last study, um, we did the same thing where we said, please help us design a technology to help kids learn. And they all designed a game. Every single one of them, it was a game. Um, 
which I guess makes sense, but, uh, but we're going to do the same level of you know, ambiguity there. And we have kids do have different roles within this. So some kids are doing kind of drawing of wireframes, some kids are recording, and they're working together. So that, that is the first condition, which is just design. The second one we're calling a sequestered problem solving experience. It's school, right? I provide instruction and you give me feedback. Um, and there's not a lot of information within that. So um, we're just being kind of smart alecky about it by calling it sequestered problem solving. But we're providing several days of instruction related to solar panels and insulation and the idea of a home that's built to balance it. And then we're seeing what kind of design features, so pre and post in addition to the designs. And then the third one is an information rich environment where they're going to have the instruction plus resources, right? So in the design process, we have access to content and we can engage in that content. So in that information rich environment, what we're assuming is that we're gonna see some different types of designs, but we don't know because really all of the research is, all of the research around participatory design essentially says we, desel, we develop technology, we use participatory design and that's essentially it. So we don't have any um, data around it. So it's quite exploratory at this point. So I can't give you a good answer in terms of dependent variables yet. That was a long way to say that, but. Uh, another question for Maya. So, uh, in the second study, you were yeah. talking about how you found the three factors. I think it was pre-test score, reading scores, and attitudes about science were yeah. influencing outcomes. Consistently across the games. Those okay. were the ones that were absolutely consistent. Yep. Yeah. So, I'm curious, when you said outcomes, were you talking about, I'm assuming, learning outcomes? But was it all, did you also look at performance within the game? Mm -mm. So how that changes yeah. what their prior knowledge is, what they bring to the game, does that change what they actually do in the game? And how that then leads to the learning outcome? We have to go there. I mean, that's where I have all this click and that data and all of these little pieces of important information that it's very hard for me to analyze right now because the way the game was designed wasn't to allow me to use that data in an effective way. Uh, and that's a real flaw. So that's really the way we need, to, we need to go and see how kids are actually interacting in the game. And there are folks that are doing that, Kettle Hut and others, um, but I just, uh, we, need to go, we need to get there, yeah. Yeah, thanks, and how, uh, how long was the play session? Did they play for like one sitting for 20 minutes or was it multiple sittings? Um, they played for one sitting in this particular game. In land science, they played for 10 hours straight. That game was a 10 hour game. Um, these games are supposed to be, the, the filament games are shorter run time. So they're really a session where they're playing that. So that's a factor as well in terms of time. Let me toss one here to it. And I'm a little curious because of the issue about the question about gender differences. Uh, we've seen similar things in um, very different population, different content, all African-American students, uh, eighth graders, algebra, gaming. Gender differences. Yeah. I mean, so we're seeing this pattern, so I'm wondering, you know, do you have any <coughs> ideas about what's happening there? I mean, we, we got very different feedback from the, the young women. Yeah. In terms of how they had engaged and interacted mm -hmm. and what they thought. I mean, they did it, but they weren't excited about it. You know, the boys were really into it. Yeah. And I, we couldn't really see any major difference in terms of their performance on the, you know, the post-test, it was, but in terms of the way that they engaged it. So I'm curious about, you got any thoughts about? I have a lot of thoughts there? about it, uh, but it, it's hard. You know, the last thing I want to do is say, these are the gender differences, and so we should make games for girls, and then we're going to end up with oh, pink God. Legos like, all over again. So we're not going, we're not doing the pink Lego route uh, but you know boys and girls traditionally do play different kinds of games I mean yeah. not you know that's a generalization but you know first-person shooter games aren't traditionally games mm -hmm. that girls play um, you know we have a daughter who loves you know Minecraft and mm -hmm. Sims and those types of collaborative games um, I think there's something about um, one the types of games you're using and so having um, opportunities for um, customization within the game so that regardless of gender people we have preferences in the way that we learn in the way that we are engaged and so building in those preferences within the game the other thing that we've seen um, in the research is that if it's a game that a particular 
um, student has not played before, they're going to present as a novice gamer. It's not going to be as much fun. They're not going to be as comfortable. So things like controllers, if I'm really more playing a game on my phone and I understand how that process work and that technology work, but then you put me in using a controller and I'm not familiar with that, I'm not going to like it as much probably, at least initially. So I think that there is, there have been studies that have said if you expose girls to games before you start data collection and they have some uh, experience, whereas before they haven't, then that novice player issue may not be quite the case. But it's a, it's a conundrum. You know, every time we see gender differences, and not just in gaming, when we do re just general STEM research and we see that, I mean, it's, it's frustrating as all heck, but um, we're just starting to scratch the surface about whether it's novice player versus whatever the um, preferences are that we can build within the system that well, might mediate that. Yeah, but the game could have had some characteristics well, that were similar yeah, to, it just yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's very frustrating. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think this was great again. So thanks a lot. Thank you.